So welcome to Churchill Methodist Church for this week's digital service. A call to worship from Philippians. This is from the message version. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got an eye on the goal where God is beckoning, beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those that you see running this same course, heading for this same goal. And so we praise God in a lovely little autumn hymn, Autumn Leaves. Autumn days when the grass is jeweled and the silk inside a chestnut shell. Jet planes meeting in the air to get refueled all these things I love so well So I mustn't forget No, I mustn't forget To say a great big thank you I mustn't forget Clouds that look like familiar faces And a winter's moon with frosted rings Smell of bacon as I fasten up my laces and the summer milkman sings. So I mustn't forget. No, I mustn't forget to say a great big thank you. I mustn't forget. Whipped up spray that is rainbow scattered and the swallow curving in the sky. Shoes so comfy though they're worn out and they're battered and the taste of apple pie. So I mustn't forget. No, I mustn't forget to say a great big thank you. I mustn't forget. Scent of gardens when the rain's been falling and a minnow darting down the stream. Picked up engine has been stuttering and stalling and the wind for my home team. So I mustn't forget. No, I mustn't forget. To say a great big thank you, I mustn't forget. So now we have a prayer of thanks as we thank God for all that he has done for us. So let us pray. Father God, we take, thank you for all that you do for us, for nature and the turning seasons and all the little pleasures that come from those things. This Sunday, after Bible study Sunday, we still think of the Bible that you've provided us with. And so we thank you for the Bible, for all the authors that wrote it over a period of thousands of years, and for all those who have translated it, and for hymn writers who have interpreted it into hymns where we can sing the faith, as our hymn book says. And most of all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Redeemer. In his name, Amen. So last Sunday was Bible Sunday, and this coming Monday, the 31st, is Reformation Day. I've got a feeling that might be an American festival for most of us around here. It seems to now be dominated by Halloween. But with those two days in mind, I've chosen this morning to look at two Bible translators from about the time of the Reformation. Paul in his letter to the Philippi that we heard as a call to worship, says, follow Jesus. And he also says, copy me to help you on the road. And he also says, copy other mature Christians. So that's the reason I sometimes like to do services like this. It's good to find out about other Christians that have been on the road before us and find out what we can learn from them. So Martin Luther and William Tyndale were a German monk and an English priest. Both lived 500 years ago. Luther, of course, is also famous for starting the Reformation, but he also wrote hymns, translated psalms, and set things to music. So let's hear, first of all, the reading of Psalm 36, and then his version of this psalm as a hymn. 
Psalm 36. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in their hearts. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For they flatter themselves in their own eyes, that their iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of their mouths are mischief and deceit. They have ceased to act wisely and do good. They plot mischief while on their beds. They are set on a way that is not good. They do not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save animal, humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me or the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie prostrate. They are thrust down unable to rise. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
So what do we know about Martin Luther? He was born in 1483, the son of a mining engineer, a middle class and ambitious family. Luther's father wanted him to go into the law, and so he provided him with a good education. He was in a terrifying storm, and if saved, he promised to dedicate his life to God. This he was saved, and so he left his university studies and became an Augustinian monk in the local monastery. It's thought that he wasn't really committed to his, a life in the law, so there might have been something of an excuse in this decision. He was already highly schooled, so within two years he had taken his vows as a monk and been ordained as a priest. He seemed to be sit settling into the academic life, but as he read and studied the scriptures, he found no justification for many of the practices of the church which he considered corrupt. He wrote 95 theses. These are critical statements for debate, and he nailed them to the door of his local church. He particularly objected to the church selling indulgences. Indul indulgences were pieces of paper uh, where by paying money for them, you could get forgiveness for certain sins. And he felt that there was no Bible uh, reason for this and it was just a form of fleecing the poor for money. So these theses that he wrote caused a bit of a commotion and led to his being called before what's called the diet of worms. Now this is not food torture uh, but a big court-like meeting uh, in a town called Worms. So, so it, it is logical. And he had to uh, renounce his writings uh, they had no intention, really, of listening to him and giving him a fair he hearing, and neither did he have any intention of recanting. And so he prepared carefully reasoned arguments, backed up by comprehensive Bible evidence. But he didn't get a proper hearing, was found guilty and excommunicated. His life was in danger. But the Holy Ro Roman Empire, which he lived in at the time, wasn't such a bad place to live because there were many uh, rulers of states which had some power and the ruler of his own local state had some sympathy with his views and so he hid him away in one of his castles to protect him from the church authorities. And while he was in those, that, that castle, Wartburg Castle it was called, he wrote his first translation into the vernacular German language of the New Testament. He did this in about nine or ten months, so it was a really sound piece of work. The other thing, of course, that made a difference at this time was having written this out, it could then be printed up using the new technology of movable metal type. Uh, this was pretty new at that time, and what it meant was within a, few, a matter of a few months, 5,000 copies were produced of this New Testament. And even though they were still very expensive at the time, they were much widely, more widely circulated than the old handwritten texts that were in, in view up until then. So Luther's ideas and others formed by his readers spread throughout the continent. And so let's sing again. Our next hymn is God Has Spoken.
Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. So the last verse of this reading was the sort of statement that really excited Luther. He added alone for faith in the last verse, justifying it on German grammar. So what he said was, salvation is by faith alone and not by good works. Uh, and so he got into a bit of trouble for paraphrasing and adding words like this. But he was just trying to emphasize this real core message of the gospel, which we all know from John 3 and 16, that we're saved through belief and not through any works of our own. So we move on then to William Tyndall, uh, a, a contemporary really of Luther's. There are some similarities between the two. He was English. He came from not too far from here, up around Slimbridge in Gloucester. He was born 11 years later, and he also benefited from a comprehensive religious and linguistic education. And he was also ordained as a priest. He was exposed to Luther's writings and also to English reformers such as the Lollards. He was a bit more Protestant than Luther. Luther always maintained that in the communion, there was actually a transformation of the elements into body and blood. Whereas Tyndall, in uh, line with Protestant thought, felt that these were symbolic. He supported the right of people to read the Bible in their own language, like Luther. Such a practice at that time was against English law. He moved to Antwerp to avoid these laws and began to study and translate. Continental universities also had access to ancient Hebrew manuscripts not available in England. So four years later, his New Testament, published using the new technology of top, top, typesetting already uh, mentioned, and ironically in the town of Worms, the town where Luther was condemned, Tyndall's books were smuggled into England. When they were found, they were burned and the establishment got even more desperate and started to burn at the stake those found with them as well. Tyndall continued to work undercover, but was eventually betrayed and imprisoned in Brussels. He was condemned, and despite efforts of Thomas Cromwell to get him released, he was executed. Mercifully, he was strangled before being burned at the stake. His last words implored the Lord to open the king's eyes. That's the king of England. Tyndall had a real gift for language. He produced simple and clear text with real poetic rhythm. His prayer was answered. Henry VIII ordered and financed an English Bible for every church in the land, accessible to and read aloud to all the people. This was called the Great Bible and was almost entirely composed of Tyndall's text with some finishing off by Coverdale, a pupil of his. The authorised King James Version, the, probably the most famous English version, New Testament, is over 84% word for word Tyndall, the Old Testament a little bit less at 70%. So Tyndall was the master translator of the English Bible. So what do we learn from these great men? From their lives? We, they had courage, they had courage of conviction, they were brave, brave. they were consist, persistent, and they ran their course, like Paul talked about, to the Philippines. We also have the gift of the Bible. 
now in a myriad of translations and available at reasonable cost to us all. We should read it daily and see it as the powerhouse of inspiration. God breathed, as Paul says to Timothy. Amen. And so we continue with our next hymn, which is Wonderful Love. So at this point in our service, then, we bring our concerns to God in our prayers of intercession. So let us pray. Father God, our world is in difficulty. Things go wrong wherever we look. We think of wars, and particularly war in Ukraine, and all the pain and suffering for both sides that that causes. We think of the climate emergency and how it's real and it's with us now and there's a huge famine in the Horn of Africa and huge floods in Pakistan and it's often the poor people who suffer. So help us to send help to them and be there with them to comfort them. We also think this week of our government as things change yet again. We ask that you would bring calm, bring level heads, bring stability, and that these people would work for our benefit and not to build their own careers. We also think of the poor who are always with us, but these poor seem to have got somehow closer. As all around us, we find that people need support from food banks and that they also uh, will need help with fuel bills as they come into this coming winter. Help us again, once again to react to these needs, to provide food for food banks, to provide warm spaces in our churches where people can come to get warm and to feel safe. Finally, Lord, we think of ourselves and all our individual circumstances. Some of us will be ill or waiting for results of tests and perhaps a bit worried. Others will be bereaved and missing their loved ones. So put your loving arms around all these people that need your presence. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and we now join together with the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And we sing our final hymn, How Deep the Father's Love. So we come to the end of our service. I'd like to share with you today something I've been sharing in a number of the churches around the circuit. It's a, a non-contact version of the piece suitable for COVID times. And we can also do it over the airwaves now to us now. So the piece is shown by this, by a drawing out. And that's, of course, that piece is the peace of the Lord. And we want it to be with ourselves. So we open our hands to the camera or open our hands to the screen as we share this uh, all around the ether one with the other so the peace of the lord be with you and we finish with the grace the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore 
Amen.